Anyway, what can you hear out of the Wagwego? What can you hear out of the Wasquahun, Garogato, and Dog, Ne, uh, Ostuha, a Guanigorian dust, no hoda, or you go out Dutch, you need to again. The Nane Wagre, the Gunu Horado, the, uh, Aguego gigas away out Dutch, Namha, Jurihoana, Ne, a Yungoyota, Homsi Jun had it, Ne, Unguana. So I just wanted to thank you and uh, welcome everybody here today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure for being uh, pleasure being here. I come. My name is Ryan D. Kerr, and I come from Wahta Mohawk Territory, and that's in southern no central Ontario, Canada. And I do a bunch of things, but they're all focused on how do we restore our language. And uh, today, when I was asked to present. This is my title, Mohawk Language for Adults, the express route for advanced proficiency. So, but what I'm really gonna talk to you about is a program we have called Ungoana Gajokwa, and that's an adult immersion school. It's a two-year program, and right now we've been going for over, almost 20 years now, 17 years, 18 years, and we're creating speakers at the high, or uh, low advanced level, so an advanced level on the American Council of Teaching Foreign Languages proficiency scale within a two-year period. So I'm going to tell you how, we, how we're doing that and some of the challenges and um, future endeavors that we have. And also coming for me, I'm a second language speaker of our language. So I, I didn't grow up with the language. I didn't start learning it until I was 21. Right now I'm 30. And I'm still learning the language today. So I know very little. I know about this much, I think, that are this much to learn. And, I realize that it's a lifetime commitment. So I'm gonna come from it from a teacher's perspective where I teach adult immersion, but also as a student in a lifetime journey of learning the language and kind of what it takes to do that. And also from a professor's perspective, uh, what it's like, uh, the things I've learned. And the couple things I've learned and we've learned at our program, of course now it doesn't work, is, uh, that we, you gonna, I don't know if oh, it's gonna work now. No, it's just, You're gonna work on it? Okay. Is that generally, if you want to learn a language, especially one of our languages, the last place to do it is at the university. Don't do that. Even though I teach our language at the university. Do not do that if you want to do that, generally. Also, um, if you wanna learn how to learn a language, don't learn it from linguists. Sorry, linguists. Generally speaking, good. Trying to. Yeah, we're working now. So, who am I? Here's a, a map of our territory: northern Ontario or southern Ontario, northern New York. It's our homeland. So, we're Haudenosaunee or Iroquoian people, and Mohawk is a language within that family. And we're not Canadians. We're not Americans. We're Mohawks, Kanyagehaga. And I'm from this community up here, Wahta, way up there. But I teach here, this is where I come, come from, uh, from a professional background, is Ungawana Gajokwa, and that's in Six Nations. Uh, it just kind of, just outside of Hamilton, just south of Toronto. I also have experience teaching immersion here in Gahnawaga. We have an adult immersion there as well. It's a two-year program. We're creating speakers as well. But like I said, I'm here right now and spend a lot of my time there, as well as a professor at UFT. University of Toronto. So there's me as a professor, you know? Somebody take my picture, trying to look cool. And then here's me as a second language learner on a bus with one of our first language speakers. I'm always learning, doing my best to pick up new words. I'm also a farmer and try to incorporate the language, our lifestyle, our culture, and, and, and restoring our language in every aspect of our life. And a lot of you probably know me from this, some of you in here. We have a video online, it's a before and after video of me learning a language. I started, I knew one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and hello, and, and bye. In a two year period, I gained ad, uh, adv advanced level proficiency. And I don't have a lot of time in this presentation, but I'd like you guys to go to this, and I'll speak a bit more about it, about this particular video. So you'll be able to see me when I started and to see me when I ended two years after. 
uh, and it's a pretty fun conversation. Now, here's the other two guys I work with. Uh, Rohahio, the young guy, he's one of our teachers. And Brian Owanadeka, Miracle, he was, one of, he was one of the creators of our program 17 years ago and continues to teach it today. Now, here's an example of one of our classes. This is an adult immersion class, the students I've taught. So now these students have reached, um, a good chunk of them have reached advanced level proficiency in the language. More, this is at Gahnawage and Hiradiwana Nirats. And I have a disclaimer, just like Wanadeka says. The disclaimer is that there's no formal research on what I'm about to tell you. This is all based on years and years of trial and error. And at the beginning of our teaching, we always tell our students, you're guinea pigs, right? Everybody's a guinea pig. We're trying our best and we're manipulating things. We're trying new things all the time. And I think uh, Stephen also mentioned, he's talking about what are the first words to learn in a language. I think I figured that out. And I think it, it's also the hardest word to learn, especially for academics. And that's, I don't know. I don't know. And I have a t-shirt that I wear on our first day of class. It says Dolga. And that means I don't know. So I walk around and people say, hey, what does your, what does your shirt mean? And I go, don't, I don't know. And they go, you don't know what your shirt means? And it's really, it represents that to be a good speaker, you have to be in low stress environments as was talked about. Uh, you have to leave your ego at the door, but that means something different for Ungwe Hunwe, for indigenous people. Um, for academics, it has something that mostly to do with ego, but for our people, it's different. Is we have a lot of baggage because of our history, right? And a lot of our people really want to learn, but to actually leave, to uh, look stupid in front of people, to feel like you look stupid in front of people, that's one of our biggest hurdles to overcome, is to leave that at the door. And that's one of the things we probably are most challenged by. We can put all, the, all of our methods and our curriculum aside, and that's the main thing. And those students who are able to overcome that baggage, because we feel that we should already know our language, right? And I noticed that too at university. I teach non-natives and, native peop and indigenous people and non-indigenous people. Oftentimes, the indigenous people sit at the back. They don't really try so much. And the non-native people, they sit up front. They're ready to go. They're asking lots of questions. That's not because they're smarter. It's nothing to do with that. It's because our, our people have this baggage and we feel that we should know and we almost feel embarrassed sometimes, but we should not feel embarrassed. It's not our fault to what's happened, right? And we have to be mindful of that and caring of that, caring towards those students. So this is the discla our, my disclaimer. So Ungawanika Jokwa, like I said, it's been around for over 17 years. And to give you guys a little background, it's an adult immersion program, like I said, one year and two year. And we've experimented with a three year program. And that's from September, a school year period, September till May. And, it's, uh, and that's every week, Monday to Friday, six hours a day, full immersion. And the summers are off. And it equals about 1,000 hours a year, a total of 2,000 hours. We also have an online program to offer what we're teaching in our first units to the greater community. We have a YouTube channel. I'll give you more information about that. And we offer night classes to people in our communities who are unable to attend full immersion. So right now, we have three and a half instructors, two full-time instructors, one TA. We also have an online person to run our online program. And we have 22 students and they're all paid $10 an hour every day. If they don't show up, they're not, they're not paid. So 30 hours a week, they get paid $300 a week. And our budget right now to run this program is 360,000, give or take. That includes rent, it includes in instructor salaries, everything. And it's not really that much. Right. 
To give you just a, a little bit of information, in Canada, French language learning as a second language, they, acquire, they, re, they get from the government $370 million a year for learning one language as a second language in Canada. For 60 to 80 indigenous languages in Canada, we get about 3.4 million, right? And that works out to about $4 and something a person, right? We don't get a lot of funding. Half of that money is from band council, which they get from gaming, and then half is from our traditional chiefs. I can answer more questions in detail about this at my uh, breakout session. So like I said, we have before and after videos, and I want to um, guide you to go check those out. And um, I'll play just a little bit of one right now, and uh, Chris will help me out with that. Don't forget the, uh, the, the audio button. Okay. What's your language background? Uh, Virgin. Okay. Okay. What can What can you say in the language? So I invite you to go check more of that video out. There's also not just myself, there's a number of our students who you can see what they've learned in just a two year period. So just to try and make it simple for everybody, because everybody's trying to really here learn what they can do in their communities. It's going to produce proficient speakers in the smallest amount of time possible. And in our situation, which is similar to most of everybody else's here, we have a limited amount of first language speakers, and a lot of our teachers who are teaching in emergent settings, they don't have the, really the capacity to be teaching in those settings. Right? So oftentimes, most of the time, since the 70s, when we've created these programs, we've had immersion since that time, and we've produced almost no high, highly proficient students since that time. So something's wrong with that. And we're realizing that, um, similar to what William said earlier, is that what we need to really be concentrating on in, certain, in this situation is to ensure that the teachers that are teaching our children have such a high pr level of proficiency that we're not gonna be bogged down by that in our school systems, but now you're gonna, not gonna be bogged down by that at the home, because that's where it really needs to happen, is at the home, and that's the focus of our program, is that we are concentrating on, on younger adults who have yet to have any kids, so that when they become a proficient speaker, they're able to bring it in the home, because the language does not exist really, it's not to exist in the school, it's to exist at the home, and the parent should always be focused on their child's learning. So at our school, we've kind of identified five elements that we, fo that we always focus on in creating a speaker. But first, we have to understand one thing about Mohawk and most languages of Turtle Island, Ungwehungwe languages, is that they're special. Well, what makes them special? They're polysynthetic. And by polysynthetic, we mean that we can, we'll say a word, and that's equal to a whole sentence in English. And that's profound, because if, you, if that's a whole sentence, that means really we have unlimited words. So a Mohawk language dictionary, like a Cherokee dictionary, like a Navajo dictionary, 
probably stand that tall and you still haven't covered all the, all the words that you need. Right? So it's something to consider. So we get these monster words, as you guys probably know what I'm talking about sometimes, really, really monster words. And those are, that's very challenging from a second language learner who knows English as a first language to grasp. Very, very challenging. I will come back to harvest corn for her again, all in one word, right? So we can go from these small words like, I will plant. And you add another morpheme in there or a noun, I will plant corn. And you add another one on the end, I will plant corn for her. What do you know? We can add even more. I will harvest corn for her. So we put something that reverses it. Put even more. I will come harvest corn for her. And again, I will come back to harvest corn for her in that massive word. Right? So you look at the sophistication in those words, it's, it's tremendous. Right? And the fact that all these little bits and pieces, they mean nothing by themselves. You can't take them apart. One part doesn't mean her. One part doesn't mean um, for. One, one part doesn't mean again. They mean nothing uh, in a vacuum. They only mean something when they're together. Right? And this is the challenge is how do we, how do students, because these words are unlimited when they change, and when you change one piece of it, it changes the rest of the word sometimes. So it's a lot for a student to handle. It's a lot on their capacity for memory. So they're also verb based. Common objects, nouns that we understand in English, are expressed through verbs. Don't quote me on the, this number, but this is what I think. I know my colleague and friend, Marianne Mathun, she's came, come up with a better number. It's around this. But Mohawk, like a lot of our language, I imagine, is about 70% verbs. And that's, that's, that's tremendous. 20% nouns, 10% particles. Keep that in mind. So something like adequar, onto itself, food put on top, it holds food on itself. What might that mean? A donkey? <laughs> Anything else? A table. All right. Where there it orb rise habitually. Where the orb rises habitually. That's east. What one dual someone speak, join, or use? What one uses for speaking? The telephone. These are all verbs. All right. So. Keeping that in mind, what are these five essential elements that we need to create a speaker for Iroquoian languages? And what we're suggesting, likely, we're not sure, but likely similar for other indigenous languages in, on Turtle Island because they're also polysynthetic and very related. One, we need a good curriculum. Two, a good teacher. Three, a good teaching method. Four, a good assessment tool. And five, good students. You don't have to drop that off really, really fast because it's going to come up again. So one, a good curriculum. What's a good curriculum in our understanding? So our curriculum focuses on a few things. One, it follows a simple to complex learning sequence. So we identify in our language what something is very easy with very little morphemes. And then we then identify something else that's a little bit harder and a little bit harder and a little bit harder. And we're always using comprehensible input through that whole period. And we're using scaffolding. So we're always helping them to using, um, I'm going to get in more into this, gestures. And we're using what they've previously learned to learn the new content. So we're not going to start at something and then the next unit, we're going to talk about something totally different that's not related to the previous one. We're going to use that previous unit to help them learn their second unit, right? Based on root word teaching, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, which is these morphemes. And the idea is that because those words change so much that when you change one little piece of it, it becomes a new word, that means we have unlimited words. So what we're saying is why learn 10,000 words when you can learn 50 rules instead that are going to teach you those 10,000 words. Okay? And students are not aware of this process most, 
principally in our first year. They don't know about this. They do not know they are learning grammar, but they are. Right? And it's all also guided by measurable goals. We're going to get back to that. What's measurable goals? So I want to want to get you guys to think about is what's more important, a good program or a good teacher? Well, I think they're both important. Uh, but, we'll, we'll, but what I think is that a good program is more important than a good teacher. Because a student can excel in an environment with a bad teacher, but still has a good program, a good curriculum. right? But to go back, simple to complex, like I said, what is simple and what is complex? Those are two different things when you come from an English mind and an indigenous language mind, oftentimes. Short words are not necessarily simple, and long words are not necessarily complex. This is something really important to keep in mind when you're designing your curriculum. For example, duntke. I will come back. Everybody can say that. Duntke, easy to say. Um, then, yagwa zero wana. I have a big family. So just to the English mind to look at that, you think, whoa, they're easy, but look, they, our first one, our short one, has six morphological components. Our second one has three. And what we're arguing is that that second one, the third one, even though it's longer, it's actually easier for our students to learn. Okay. And that also, not everything that is simple is easy to describe. I went shopping. Simple, in English. I went shopping. When we look at that, we see there's seven grammatical elements in there. And that's a lot for a student to handle. So something like this, we're not going to teach until our second year. Maybe in a few months into our second year. Even though it seemed, they might learn it uh, just organically at the table when we're eating lunch together, or at break time, those things are all go. But in our curriculum, it's not going to be taught in there. We start with the simplest aspects of the language that we have identified, and we make use of them in simple and interesting conversations. We start by describing the way that something is for the entire first year, mostly. Not what something would have been, or it did happen, or it does happen, or will keep on doing, or it could have happened. No, we don't even go there. What something is right now, like I am, you are, she is, he is, it is, we are, they are. That seems a little simple there because in Mohawk, and I think it's the same for a lot of languages, in, 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 in indigenous languages, we have a mass amount of pronouns. Mohawk, we got like 80 pronouns. That's a lot, okay? And it's very descriptive. A lot. And it's hard. But it's not that hard. So things like, I'm smart, you are tall, she is listening, he is married, it is raining, we are singing, they are playing. These are all things that are right now, they are, they is, am, those things. And this is, um, our, this is one method of keeping it simple. Very simple. So in our first year, we have simple descriptions like I just said. I am tall. I'm not tall. And other than just describing the way it is, we also talk about the way it will be, it was, and it would be. So it's always in a present tense, right? It will be, it would be, it was, it is right now. So basically, year one is photographs, theoretically. Describing photographs. So we talk about these as statives. They're a state right now, not actions. Okay. So something like, it's raining, as opposed to, it rained. So well, what in unit one, what does that mean? Our very first day, this is all, in immer all in immersion. We make simple conversations, making statements, questions, answers, using negatives, qualifiers, and conjunctions. We only use two verbs, to like and to know. 
So here's a little example of the progression. I provided the translation. I did my best to do this. I'm not sure if it will be the perfect way of doing it, but we'll see. I'll, I'd appreciate your comment after. E. Rauha. Unkane Rauha. Who is he? Now we're engaging these students and we're, making, we're really encouraging them to speak. He is John. John Ne Rauha. He's John. Rauha ga ne John. No, he's not John. Ya Rauha de go ne John. If he isn't John, who is John? Doga ya Rauha de go ne John, unka ne John. Ya te waga de yondre, unka ne John. I don't know who John is. So we're constantly progressing with new words based on what was taught prior. And this continues and continues and continues, ensuring that they comprehend everything that's happening through gestures, through acting out, through writing on the board, all these things. So the end of unit one, which takes about three weeks, give or take, they end up saying things like this. I know that you still like him, but do you know if he still likes you? Doesn't that girl who likes you know that you don't like her at all and that I like her very much? So they're putting together these really long sentences after three weeks, and that's not memorized. That's them learning the syntax, and even though they were not teaching them syntax uh, on a board, we're not telling them we're teaching them syntax, they're learning it. So just to give you an idea, because I know some of you want, I wasn't originally going to put this, but then I realized that some of you want more of the nitty gritty information for your own programs. So in our unit two to five, remember that these take around three weeks. We focus on kinship, age, marital status, being somewhere, physical and mental, emotional states, and then we get into the past, present, and future. So if we're starting in early September, uh, this brings us to uh, end of October, November. And unit six. This is in later in probably January, February. And we've realized that when we're only talking about states, it really limits our students. And they're only really learning them, at, like I said, at home or uh, during lunch, these kind of things. So we decided to bring in a few action words, so different tenses for those. So instead of how things are, we space, have basic verb forms. Like, I jump, I jumped, I have jumped, I won't jump, these kind of things. We move on to unit seven to 11. Then we focus on nouns. The interesting thing here is that when we start in September, we do not teach nouns until February or March. So a pencil, a book, a shoe, a table, that's not even focused on at all in our curriculum. And the reason why is because nouns do not produce full sentence speech. Verbs do. Right? And those are, one, those are the hardest things to really gain uh, capacity in, in using is our verbs. Uh, so we, then we go on to personal possessions, foods, environments, body parts. And we start to use those nouns with all the verbs that we've learned up till then. So remember that, that most of the time it's, we're focused on verbs. So the end of our first year, this is generally, uh, this is an example of a story of what our students can, can, can do at the end of their first year. And remember that I said this is September till late May, 30 hours a week. I'm from Wata, that's where I'm from. I am Mohawk and I am 30 years old. My parents are Maria and the late Raymond DeCare. My mother is still alive, but my father is passed away. They were not married. My mother is a housekeeper and my, my father was a cranberry farmer. This is true, by the way. My mother is not a Mohawk speaker and neither was my father. My mother is still living in the same house today. I have four siblings, three older brothers and one older sister. Three of them are still alive and one has passed away. I am now grown up and I am teaching Mohawk language. I really like my job and I am very happy. End of first year. Year two. This is when we start to focus on complex descriptions, which we kind of talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Something like I chopped wood for her again. I went and bought groceries for her again. Describing actions, 
events and all their complexities. So this is to look at year one as more as we're describing pictures, things that are. And year two, we focus more on actions because this is those verbs start to get really, really complex. Here's an example. And I encourage you to think about what these are for your own language. I planted. I planted something there. I planted something again. I planted something there again. I planted many things. I unplanted something. I planted something for her. I have gone to plant something. So these are all those different morphemes. But like I said, we're not, ne we're not necessarily there teaching them. We're not doing verb drills. It's all put in context. So we go from something as simple as a verb as he will buy it to he will buy something for her to he will buy flowers for her. This is all one word. He will buy flowers for her again. And he will go buy flowers for her again. And imagine for a lot of your languages here, you can do something similar to this. And the point is, is that that bottom word is much more complex than that first word for a second language learner who speaks English as a first language, especially. So this is what we call the root word method is all about. And it's enabling students to think in the language so that they can com comprehend and say something they've never heard before. So our students can say things, create words in their mind, and they've never heard them before. And most of the time, not always because there are always exceptions in our language, most of the times they're right because they've learned how the bits and pieces go together and we put them into context, context and they have the capacity on their own to create these words. They don't have to rely on whether they saw it in a dictionary, whether grandma saw it, any of these kind of things because the reason why this is important in the indigenous language context in our communities, most of us, we're not learning Spanish, we're not learning Mandarin, we can't just go to the store and use it. For most of us, we can't just go outside and it's where we can't, usually we can't just watch uh, Star Wars. Oh, I think Lakota, I think you can get that now, but I don't know. For most of us, no. We don't have very much opportunity to hear the language. We have to, this is an experience of mine. You spend m about half your energy trying to find a speaker before you actually get the opportunity to use it. And then by that time, you're almost, you're half tired. So we have to give students the capacity to be able to create words, do things on their own in times where they don't have those opportunities. And this is one way. So our end of second year story is this. I started learning Mohawk when I was 21 years old. It seems like yesterday, but nine years have already passed since then. I thought I would have been able to learn it in just two years, but now I realize I will always be learning new things. I've, I, would ne I would have never thought that I would get the opportunity to come to Santa Fe to learn from so many great people. I have already met many people and hope that we stay good friends forever. So that was our curriculum. Here, a good teacher. How am I for time? 20 minutes. Oh man, I gotta speed up. So a good teacher. What do we mean by a good teacher? Our teachers do these things. They know, like I just said, what is simple and what is complex. And that's for in teaching, but also at lunchtime, also in the night, that a teacher can recognize where a student is at, and then they can, all, they, they can introduce new words that are slightly more complex than where the student's at to encourage them, rather than words that are so beyond their ability that it almost uh, it discourages the student. So a good teacher kind of is almost always assessing who they're, who they're talking to. What's something a little bit more complicated that it can introduce to them to push them? And what this is kind of we use in an Actifil OPI is to push the, what they say is a floor to ceiling approach. You're always trying to push them a little bit more. They have to know the rules. Remember, they're not teaching the rules, but they have to know the rules. Something like this. So what our teachers know. That's how two morphemes go together. When one's attached here to this one, they change one a little bit. We, we believe that it's important for them to know these things because it, it gives them the ability to know what is really morphologically complex. They have an, high, an advanced or higher level of proficiency. Our goal is to get, reach advanced low proficiency, so we need, a, we need teachers who are at least at that level. 
They can create a low anxiety learning atmosphere. They're fun, like, we spoke at, like I spoke at the beginning of the presentation. They make students feel like it's okay to make mistakes. Because as soon as you're comfortable with looking stupid in a class, you're like that. And that's the biggest mistake I made when I started. As you do not say anything until you think you know it perfect in your mind. As soon as you get out there and look like an idiot and you're still okay with that, man, you learn way faster. Try and create that for your students. It's more challenging, but there are certain teachers have a real good uh, quality in, that, in doing that. They can create interesting learning experiences. So things like doing gestures, acting, not looking stupid, having fun in the class, these kind of things. They, have, they understand what it's like to be a student. And a lot of our first language speakers don't, but some of them do. So this is an interesting thing, which begs the question, what's a better teacher in this situation? A first language speaker or a second language speaker? We'll talk a little bit about that. They're patient and approachable. A good teaching method. We use as many things as we can. Our methods, total immersion. The day they go into class, everything is all in Geha in the language. We use the root word method. Thanks, Chris. And I'm going to just play you the root, a little bit more detail than what that is. It's only like a two-minute video. Thanks, Chris. The problem with teaching Ganyo Geha, or any Iroquoian language, is that a single one of our words is the equivalent of a whole sentence in English. For example, the word Ronasquahetka can be translated as, he has an ugly animal. And the word Yagonaktiyo can be translated as, she has a nice bed. And the word Rodinosagayo can be translated as, they have an old house. At first glance, these words are completely different, and students in other programs learn them as separate and unrelated. But students at Ungawana do not learn or see these as whole words. Instead, they are taught the small bits of meaning contained within those words, bits of meaning that we call roots, that have to do with he and she and they, and houses and beds and animals, and nice and old and ugly. The students learn how to assemble these roots into whole words. They also learn how to substitute she for he and they for she, and bed for house and animal for bed, and old for nice and ugly for old. Students learn how to create a large number of words from a small number of roots. For example, in just a few weeks, Students learn how to combine 11 prefixes and 70 noun roots and 20 verb roots, a total of 101 roots that can be together combined to create more than 15,000 words. The root word method works because it's much easier and faster to learn 100 roots than it is to learn 15,000 words. In the entire year, students have to learn approximately 600 roots plus 200 prefixes and suffixes, and the rules for putting them together, and the exceptions. But once they've learned these 800 bits of meaning, students can create literally millions of single words. Students using the root word method then are not remembering words that they've been taught, because it's impossible to teach a million words, let alone learn or remember them. Instead, students are learning how to think in the language, they're not trying to remember what someone told them. They're thinking how to say what they want to say. The root word method was first developed by David Ganadawako Miracle and later refined by Ongwawana. Because Ganyongeha and other Iroquoian languages share the same grammar and structure, the root word method can easily be used by other language groups. At so I encourage encourage you to revisit that video. Scaffolding. We're always using what they know previously to help them learn new things, and we're always supporting them in any way to, act, to achieve comprehension of what we're doing, or of what we're trying to get across. We encourage our students to learn by ear rather than to learn by seeing and what we mean by writing. Is that our students, they gather, they don't have any tables, they just have chairs, and they don't actually write anything down until 
five, six months into the program. They, of course, write them down in their spare time, but in class, we do not allow any writing at all. And a lot of people, I think we have to understand this, that a lot of our people now, because of our education system, because of academia, it's taught through eyes, through reading, right? A lot of students think that that's how they learn, but I think we need to develop the capacity in all our students to learn by ear. We encourage our students to speak from the moment, the first five minutes into the class. Floor to ceiling, like I said, we're always pushing our students. We are always analyzing where they are and pushing them a little bit more. We're not giving them something that's really complex after, or something a little bit more complex. We require our students to use flashcards. Anki and Quizlet is what we use. I, I encourage everybody here as teachers to check out Anki. And that's a flashcard software you can get on any device. And this uses space repetition. So when you, you create a flashcard, and when you look at a word to try and memorize it, you're able to click whether it's easy, kind of hard, or really hard. If you click easy, it won't ask you that word again for a week. If you click hard, it'll ask you again in five minutes. And you keep doing that and doing that, and it really optimizes your memorization for being used in the class. We also offer, we don't require any homework. I think I would like to require homework. We've come to a point where we don't offer homework because a lot of our students uh, have a lot of resp responsibility outside of the classroom. So if you think about it, they're there for six hours a day. They have to do some other things to maintain their life. Some of them don't get paid enough because they have kids. Uh, some of them have other jobs, these kind of things. So in order, they're already there all day long. We try and reduce homework. However, the students that do go home, study as much as they can, try and meet speakers, do these kind of things, they're always going to do much better, and we encourage that. And a part of our methods is to always try new methods. And I think this is one of the, the great things about our program is really we're not afraid to try new things. We make that known to our students at the beginning is that we're not really experts, we're just trying things and taking note of what works and what doesn't. That's all. And then we're being honest with ourselves. Hey, that didn't work. Oh, well. And the students know that, right? And I think when your students know that, they're OK with that. You don't have to be a, a perfect e expert. You don't have to be the best teacher in the world. You just have to be conscious of what you're doing and then always be analyzing whether it's working or not. A good assessment tool. Our assessments, we assess our students through an oral proficiency interview, through oral tests. And this is from the American Council of Teaching Foreign Languages, or ACTAFIL. Now, we do these once at the end of the year. And our, so these assessments are focused on proficiency, not fluency. How proficient how your abilities within certain areas. I encourage you to check this out. ACTAFIL has created an inverse cone, which represents your, uh, your proficiency level is increasing, that it's easy to go from novice to intermediate and little, and then it gets harder and harder and harder as you go all the way to distinguished. At the novice level, students can speak and memorize words and phrases, and they cannot create with language on their own, and they cannot sustain a conversation. Intermediate speakers, they can speak in complete sentences, can create language, can ask questions, they can sustain simple and basic conversations on personal matters within your own personal realm. Advanced speakers, they can speak in paragraphs of interconnected discourse, meaning they can connect everything, not just sentences, connect it all into one flow. They can make an argument and defend an opinion, and they can sustain in-depth conversations on a wide variety of subjects. Now, this oral proficiency interview, now that, that before and after video that I showed you, that was an oral proficiency interview. Both were. It assesses, they're great, they're a good thing because they assess a student's ability in the language, their proficiency, 
It assesses whether the teacher is doing well, because if their students aren't, aren't, producing, aren't uh, becoming proficient, we obviously know we're doing something wrong, and programs as well. And this is what we do for our instructors. If they are not, I think it's the same in Hawaii, I don't know, that for our program, uh, we, our, our teachers, like I said, have to be at least advanced low in order to teach in our program. And it can also be set, used to set community language standards. So in Six Nations, where I teach, we have a number of different programs for adults because it's complex for us, not just one language. We have six, or six languages in our own community. So it can help set standards for those programs where, okay, if this, all these adult immersion programs, they all have to be reaching these levels within this amount of time. And if they're not, they're not, make, they're not uh, achieving those standards. So to go back, and with this in mind, with those assessments, is that a good program, a good curriculum is guided by goals, measurable goals. And by measurable, we're talking about these proficiency levels. And those goals must correspond with the time required to achieve proficiency. So if your goal is to reach advanced proficiency in two weeks, you need to recheck your goal. So to look at this again, currently this is our goals in our program, and this is generally what we've been producing for the last 10 years. After our first year, our students reach intermediate low. And in their OPI, their oral proficiency interview, if they do not achieve this, they are not permitted to go into their second year. They are, however, uh, given the opportunity to take the first year again if they want. Our second year, our goal is to reach advanced low. If they don't reach that level, they technically do not pass our course in that way. So there's no marks. We've done marks um, with projects, these kind of things. And uh, specifically, I had that in Gahnawage where we had a proficiency interview at the end of the program where we had students who did really well, but they had terrible marks. And then we had other students who had really great marks, but they had terrible proficiency interview. So something's not right here. And are we want to be focused on marks, or we want to be focused on proficiency? And that depends on your goal. And our goal, and I think our goal should be, is creating speakers, is proficiency first and foremost. And if it's not, then you need to be thinking more about how your curriculum's guided. So now, one of the things I'm, I'm doing and thinking about right now is designing a third year program. Because we've realized that two years is not enough. I spoke with Finley earlier. He also believes two years is not enough. Especially if our goal is to uh, restore intergenerational transmission. Those students who are finishing those two years cl of class, oftentimes they really don't yet have the capacity to go home and raise kids in every single, in every single space that they can. Right? So to say something, oh, don't forget to brush the roof of your mouth or something like that. Can you say that? Or, or pick that little piece of tea, uh, food out of the side of your mouth. These kind of things are very, very obscure things, but they're very important that you use with your children. So it's year three is something we're talking about right now. And what we're doing now is we're focusing more on themes, we think. Themes that are specific to those, for those students' lives. Year four. And that's what we, or I, I firmly believe, I think we need four years. Do we have the funding right now? No, that's our, that's our major problem, is we need that funding and we're, we're hoping on some funding. So our first year, that we've, this is through experience, not through any research or academic research. We found that we can get to intermediate low in about 1,000 hours. It takes about 1,000 hours for Mohawk. Now, this is for a language that has very little resources, that doesn't have any uh, DVDs, really, um, and that hasn't had a lot online, and it happens Monday to Friday throughout the entire year. And also, that they take the whole summer break off. Thanks. That's one of our challenges as well. It's an issue, because they forget a lot in the summer. So that's for that situation. These are also from students who learn, who have English as their first language. It tends to take about 1,000 hours, given that context. And this matches up 
somewhat approximately with other languages which are considered level four languages if your language is English as a first language, the difficulty. So we say that our language is, is like learning Arabic as a second language coming from English. It's way more challenging than say learning French or learning Spanish. Our second year takes 2,000 hours. So that's focused to get uh, advanced low. Now, we want, what, where will this, if I go back, where will th year three, will that take us another 3,000 hours to get it to advanced high? We don't know. We haven't really tried it enough yet. And what level do we really need to be at to sustain intergenerational transmission? These are questions we always have to continually be asking ourselves. So I've only got three minutes, I think, left. Fine to finish it off. We also need good students. And I think it's important to look at students like a building block of a house. If you're going to build a house, I don't know if you want to use a really, really old block, really old um, <laughs> uh, brick. Although we do allow students from anywhere from 17 all the way up to 60 if they want. But we do focus on younger 20, uh, in their early 20s. So students, quality building material. And uh, also Stephen mentioned, and I agree, that students don't necessarily have to be motivated or determined. But one thing we witness in our communities is that a lot of our people, uh, the one of our challenges and people ask is, how do you get our students to actually want to learn? Right? And it does help in our program to have students who want to be there, who are going to commit their time to be there early. And one thing we do to, to have students like that is we have an entry exam, an entry test, where they have to learn the major pronouns in the language for one verb. So we have this idea, well, if they're not going to spend the time to learn those pronouns on their own, then what are they going to do in class? So we're trying to weed out the ones who aren't really there, really committed for the whole time. They're a certain age. Now, I, you can learn a language at any, any age. But if our focus is on intergenerational transmission and we want to target students who are going to have kids, we want to focus on them. Because although, although teaching 60-year-olds is fun and it's, it's important for them to learn as well, when we're thinking about the big picture, they give the time. And I put sacrifice up there with stars. Because I don't want to look, we shouldn't have to sacrifice anything to learn our language. But this is what a lot of our best students are having to do. They're having to quit their jobs, they're having to take extra time, all these kind of things. And let's, that produces a good student. So as a good program, we're trying to relieve some of this sacrifice. How do we do that for them so that they don't actually have to? And they leave their egos out the door. And that's the final one. And this is our e my email. My email's at the top, Care at UTeron University of Toronto. And also our school email is ungawana at gmail.com if you want any information. Nyawa goa, thank you guys for listening. Tony Gawan, I guess.